Is my screen showing up? Yes. OK, good. So um, this was a great idea, I think, by Dr. Kim Wallens to give a little bit of a background on the LGBTQ patient that we often see um, and get us a better idea of who the patients are and how we can interact with them a little bit better. Um, I am uh, obviously a colorectal surgeon, but I only do colon cancer and anal cancer and rectal cancer since I work at a cancer center. Um, and a large part of my practice is that actually anal cancer. So I end up, of course, seeing a lot of HIV positive men who have sex with men. And that's kind of how this practice started for me. And then I started getting involved in LGBTQ kind of medical research. And we have a couple of grants looking at this uh, topic. So some of the stuff I'll be talking about today is uh, based on some grant work that we've already had and some future grants that we're applying for, mostly in, in the education realm. Um, I teach this lecture, a similar lecture, to uh, the medical school and to the residents, um, as well as we have an ongoing program with um, the oncologists, oncologists through the ASCO. So some of this are actually a topic that's already been vetted in research. Um, it's going to be short, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can just go through a couple of slides. Uh, I didn't want to like talk the whole time, but maybe make this more of a conversation and hopefully get um, everyone back to their work day, you know, in half an hour or so. Um, so just some vocabulary. And I, I think, you know, when I first started in this space, I was kind of inundated with the vocabulary, which I think we all struggle with only because this ever growing LGBTQ plus acronym seems to be gaining a letter every year. Um, and it's hard to keep track of who everybody is. Um, so if there's one thing hopefully that we can gain from today's discussion is how to talk to the group and what every, who everybody is more so than anything else. So just some core vocabulary. Um, sexual orientation is basically who you sleep with, right? Do you identify as gay, straight, homosexual, heterosexual, queer, or men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women? So I use each of these labels differently in my practice depending on who I'm talking to. Um, so in common vernacular and probably for the rest of this talk, I'll just describe everybody as gay, regardless of who you are and who you have sex with, only because it's really hard to say the opposite. Um, so I think gay and straight is pretty uh, universally accepted. You're probably not going to offend anybody. Homosexual and heterosexual tend to be a little bit more clinical. Uh, less younger people identify themselves as homosexual and heterosexual only because they prefer other words. Um, so this is probably more of a clinical uh, discussion and probably more of a research uh, term, which even in research we don't use very much anymore, but it's still perfectly acceptable. In the medical record, I always write men who have sex with men or women who have sex with women or men who have sex with men and women, MS, MSWM, um, only because that's, at the end of the day, that's what I care about. I care about how you have sex and who you have sex with. So uh, in the medical record, I'll have a 36-year-old MSM, and that's usually how I write it, only because I'm a terrible typist and uh, that's quicker for me. Um, but I've seen people you know, describe this in many, many ways. Uh, this is just the way I choose to do it, but I think it's perfectly acceptable to write 36-year-old gay man as well. Um, queer is an interesting term because queer probably, definitely when I was young and definitely for the generation before mine, meant very, something very different to the generation that is upcoming. So, you know, if you ask a 60 year old gay man, if he identifies as queer, he'll take this as an insult most likely because in his generation, this word tends to have a very uh, negative connotation. If you ask a 20 year old gay man, are you queer? And they most likely will say yes, if not self-identify as queer from the beginning. So I think this is a very, evolving term, whereas in the younger generations, this term tends to mean anyone who is not straight cisgender, right? So anybody else is considered queer, which is kind of more accepting in a way, but you just have to be careful with who you're throwing this around with. So I tend to let the patient self-describe as queer before I start throwing around this word, only because it can get kind of charged if I start throwing it around without the patient's acceptance of it but it's still a very, very acceptable term. And more and more, I'm seeing more research papers uh, with queer as uh, the, one of the you know, key phrases in the terms. So the label is not as important as the practice. And what I mean by that is that the 
I really care about what's going on in the patient's life, not so much of how they self-identify or how they name themselves. Um, it's really just what are they doing in practice? What is their everyday life like? The label, it helps in the EMR, but other than that, it doesn't really help me so much. Um, a key, you know, kind of thing to remember about this is in some populations, it's okay to have same-sex relationships and consider yourself straight. For instance, uh, there's been some research work in the HIV world, especially among the intersectionality of Black HIV positive men, especially in the inner cities. And you can see in a very uh, metropolitan area, it's very normal within that subculture to consider yourself straight and still have sex with men. So in this sense, in that population, if you ask that man, are you gay? They will say no, because by their definition, they're not. So that is why it's really important to find out, well, ask the follow-up question. Well, you're not gay, you're not straight, what are you? But who do you have sex with? Because at the end of the day, that's what's most important. The second term that I wanna get through is gender identity. And this is kind of confusing for me at the beginning, but then once you kind of uh, get through it, it makes much more sense. And the first one's obviously transgender. And that's when a patient's birth gender is different from their now gender. So their gender at birth is whatever the doctor said whenever they were born. Oh, congratulations, Mrs. Smith, you have a beautiful baby boy. Now that patient will grow up eventually and may or may not associate themselves with that assigned gender at birth. Anybody who falls in this category is transgender, meaning their birth gender does not match who they think they are right now. So this common phrases for this is a trans woman, a trans man, just calling them transgender or trans. Now, the difference between a trans man and a trans woman is it's who you are now is how I think of it. So a trans woman was born male and is now a woman. A trans man was born female and is now masculine. So I think the, this kind of will play later on as we go through a couple of examples, but that's the easiest way for me to remember it is trans meaning you're not what you were born at birth and what you are now, woman or man. Um, it's also interesting the word transition. So a lot of the transgender patients will describe their transition between their gender assigned at birth and their current gender. And it's not a point A to a point B. It's more of a long-term, most likely, transition with several steps along the way. So most transgender patients will not say, I became a man when I had this, when I started hormones, when I had bottom surgery, when I had top surgery, when I changed my driver's license. There is no defi defining moment at which point that patient describes themselves, okay, now I'm a man or now I'm a woman. So the important thing to think of when treating transgender patients is that in their mind, they have been a man their whole life, that they were just misassigned at birth. So there's not a single point in life in time when these patients all of a sudden become a man or a woman. So they think of this as a transition where it's gradual. Some patients tend to go right away and have all of their, you know, surgeries that they may need, may want, may have all of their legal work done all at the same time. Some patients may have just a part of it and some patients may have none of it. So it's really important for us to uh, allow the patient to describe their own gender identity in their terms, not in our terms. It's not my business whether or not I consider a, a man or a woman based on your genitalia or based on your driver's license. It's really based on what that patient feels is their own identity. Um, cisgender is pretty much everybody else. So cisgender is the patient who was assigned a gender at birth and still considers themselves to be at that gender. This is an interesting topic that I, you know, want to spend a little bit of time on, um, which for me, I'm obviously we're all surgeons, so we're all fairly visual people. So I'm hoping this will resonate with you guys as well. Um, and this is the different axes of someone's sexuality. So somebody way smarter than me came up with this gender bred person. And what they described is, well, what are the axes of someone's sexuality? So if you're gay, you sleep, if you're gay male and you sleep with men, does that mean that you dress like a woman or does that mean that 
you're trans and you are gay and a lesbian, you know, it just can get super, super confusing. And, you know, maybe we're more used to these terms now, but definitely my parents are not. So I wanted to just go over this with you, with everybody, so we can identify the different parts of someone's sexuality so that when we address a patient, we know what axes we are talking about. And really this applies for everybody. So no matter how straight, no matter how cisgender, no matter who you are, everybody falls somewhere along this spectrum. Even if you're all the way to the left or all the way to the right, you're gonna fall somewhere along these lines. So if you can see my cursor, I'm not sure. We'll start with gender identity. And this is, well, who does your brain think you are? Does your brain think you have a certain degree of womanness or a certain degree of manness? Now, some people may be 100% woman, 0% man, or vice versa, or somewhere in between, but this is what your brain is telling you who you are, and this is your gender identity. The next thing is your gender expression, and that is, who are you telling society that you are? Are you telling society that you are a certain percentage of feminine, a certain percentage of masculine, or some combination therein? And this gender expression is really based on what you're showing society in terms of your mannerisms, your clothes, your speech, um, you're walking down the street, is somebody going to say, there goes a very feminine person, or there goes a masculine person, or there goes somebody who's probably somewhere in between. And that is, you know, the harder one sometimes for us to pick on, but that is what we're going to see the first time we walk into a clinic to see the patient, it's really going to be their gender expression which can sometimes be misleading. The next one is biological sex. Obviously, this cannot be changed. These are your chromosomes. This is what are you made up? What are you at risk for? For me as a cancer surgeon, this is the one that I care about because this is the one that tells me, well, if you have a prostate, then you're at risk for prostate cancer. You can't change that unless your prostate gets removed. If you have a uterus, you are at risk for uterine cancer. No bones about it. So biological sex obviously is the one that is the least uh, obviously changeable, let's say, and the most predictive of any cancer future risks. Just as an aside, we'll talk about you know, cancer and specific uh, clinical care on the second version of this talk. So I'll save some of this for later. Um, and the last one is who are you romantically attracted to? Um, are you romantically attracted to more feminine? Are you romantically attracted to more masculine? And as you can see, this is irrespective of everything else. So you can identify, uh, your brain can tell you that you are 100% woman. You can express your gender as say 60% woman, 40% man. Your biological sex can be 100% woman because you're XX, but you can be romantically attracted to either women or men having nothing to do with anything above. So the important thing that I wanted to get through with this genderbred person is that, you know, there was a common misconception that a trans woman, so somebody who was born a man is now a woman, has to be sexually attracted to man. Well, no, because there are different axes. There are whole different equations. So who you were born, who you express, and who you're romantically attracted to are three different questions. Um, I had a, pay, uh, sorry, a student one time say, the difference between all of this is your gender identity is who you go to bed as, and romantically attracted is who you wake up next to, which I thought was really well said. Um, so it's kind of important to like just separate these topics in your brain. Um, so a little bit more on this alphabet soup, uh, which we you know kind of touched on in the beginning, um, of some things that are very acceptable and some things that I would probably steer away from. Um, it's very, again, acceptable to call someone lesbian or gay, men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women. Um, you know, unacceptable terms would be something like, oh, that's so gay. You know, th that's probably not something that most of us say anymore, but still something that, you know, you want to shy away from if you do hear it. Um, you know, by an ally, we all know, you know, one that I hear a lot, actually, um, and by people who I think mean well, you just probably don't know, is sexual preference. Um, you know, the more acceptable term is sexual orientation and not sexual preference. I always quote Lady Gaga here and I say, baby, you were born this way. It's not something that these patients are choosing. This is something they're born with. So by calling something a sexual preference means that these patients have some control over it. Um, and you know, most people will admit that if they had any control over it, they would choose not to be this because it's much easier to be the opposite. So um, let's try to stay away from sexual preference and move more towards uh, a sexual orientation. Um, 
sorry, this thing is going crazy. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, it's very uh, easy for someone to say the patient is openly gay. Um, I, there we go. Um, that's probably the more common way or the safer way of saying someone's out, you know, they're open. Um, you know, when, the, when you say, oh yeah, the patient admitted to me that he was gay, that can, tends to put a, some criminal nature, some pejorative spin on the conversation that you'd want to stay away from. Another one that we steer away from is, um, trans, is transvestite training. Um, those probably were very acceptable. Put transvestite was very acceptable. Um, it's interesting, when I first started in this field, we got a paper in probably my highest impact paper ever in one of the top three medical journals, and the title of the paper had transvestite in it. So it gets often cited because it's a very a citable paper, and it has the word transvestite, which makes you cringe a little bit now. But at the time, it was a very acceptable term. Um, now we choose to say transgender. Um, so this is probably a safer term to use. As we talked about before, this whole transitioning process is a spectrum, it's a transition. We like to say there's no defining points at which you start and end. So, you know, calling somebody, hey, she's pre-op or he's post-op, other than after their lap colon. Um, in this world, it doesn't really apply, so we would stay away from it. Um, another word that, you know, is probably easy to stay away from is sex change. Um, many people call it sexual affirmation surgery, sexual reassignment surgery. I don't know how many of us in this room have done it before, um, but we really don't say sex change anymore. Um, queer, we talked about, is kind of could be a good and a bad term. Um, again, homosexual lifestyle just goes to that preference that we're trying to stay away from. Um, the other one that I hear a lot of, especially because I'm a gay man with two kids, um, is, you know, mom and dad. Um, you know, automatically every teacher saying, hey, moms, don't forget to dress your kids tomorrow in their blue shirts, you know, for picture day or whatever it may be. Um, a, that assumes that only the moms dress their kids and B, that assumes that every child has a mom, which both are fallacies. So those are kind of things that we would want to stay away from in just our common day um, and say two moms, two dads, probably parents is a more, you know, reasonable one. Um, this really goes into the pediatrician's office, not so much, obviously, in our careers. Um, but when the pediatrician is going to call back the parents and call back the child, uh, they can call back the child first. And when they're ready for the parents to join in the clinical uh, assessment, they can say, hey, parents of Jimmy, come on back, as opposed to Jimmy's mom and dad. Um, and that's something that we can kind of keep an eye on with our front desk staff. Um, so some examples that we tend to do, which I think we all fall for, um, you know, when you walk into a clinic room and you see uh, a patient and a female companion, um, you can say, Mr. Smith, though, do you have a girlfriend? Well, that assumes that this woman and Mr. Smith are somehow romantically connected. That also assumes that Mr. Smith is straight and that this woman is straight as well. A lot of assumptions. Um, so what I tend to say is, hi, Mr. Smith, I'm Dr. Sanchez. Can you introduce me to everybody in the room? And then I let Dr. Mr. Smith, who's my patient, say, this is my girlfriend or this is my daughter. I'm in Florida, so oftentimes the one who you think is the daughter is actually the girlfriend. So we have to be very careful here with who we are assigning which label to. Um, the other thing I let the patient do is have their own uh, labeling. Mr. Smith, what pronouns do you feel comfortable with? Now, obviously the patient from you know, the sticks of Florida who is most certainly not gonna know what I'm talking about when I ask him this, I probably would steer away from it. Um, but the patient who, you know, I, I feel that I need more clarification on, I would feel very comfortable from the beginning asking this, you know, question to clarify what pronouns I choose to use. I'll have uh, two scenarios at the, at the end that we can discuss this further. And then what happens if you make a mistake? Believe me, we all do. I definitely do. And there'll be times when I'll ask the patient, the patient will be very feminine expressing, coming in with very feminine looking clothes, very feminine uh, attire and demeanor. And I ask them what pronouns and they say he pronouns and I still get it wrong two minutes later. So you can just say, oh shit, I'm sorry. You know, I, I didn't mean to make this mistake. You told me already once and I apologize. Um, I'm really focused on your cancer care and I please, ex you know, excuse me. Um, and most patients will own it and they'll be accepting and be very happy actually that you recognized it. Because remember, these patients are going to go to the grocery store and get the same mistake three or four times a day. So you're not the first person to make this mistake. 
but you may be the first to recognize it for them that day. And that's what's really important. Um, so just some factors that we can you know, talk about in our own clinic space in terms of uh, cultural factors, such as the Health Equality Index, the Human Rights Campaign, which is this blue the equality sign. Um, we can have um, some gender neutral bathrooms. Uh, our hospital policies are also kind of important. I'm gonna go through some of this uh, in the next slide. So I'll go through two research studies real quick, and then we can have a little bit more of a discussion. So one is uh, a study we did here at Tampa Pride, where we actually took to the streets and we asked the you know, kids, adults, everybody that was there, um, so a couple of questions about their healthcare experiences. So we asked them in the first column, how often are you asked about your healthcare, um, how often are you asked by your healthcare providers about your sexual orientation and identity? So the always is the green and the purple is never or rarely. So you can see that most patients are either rarely or never asked about their sexual orientation. Uh, in the second group of columns, we asked the patients, do you believe that disclosing your sexual orientation is an important aspect of your care? Almost all of the patients said, yes, it is very important, which is contrasted to how many people actually got asked, which was interesting. Um, and few patients actually said that it was not important. So clearly the patients understand that it is important for them to disclose, um, but maybe we're not doing a great job of asking, which seems to be the takeaway from this experience. Um, then, the rest we can probably skip through. Um, next, we took it to uh, our through ASCO. So we went to the American Society of, of uh, Surgical Oncology. Oh, sorry, American Society of Clinical Oncology uh, members, and we asked them how often they take a history of sex, including sexual orientation. And you can see among ASCO members, the vast majority did not actively take a sexual orientation history when confronted with the patient. Now you can uh, argue that the standard prostate cancer patient or the standard breast cancer patient may not need sexual orientation information, but as we'll learn about in the next section, they do. Um, so it's really important for us to identify that we are not doing a good job of taking a good history when it comes to sexual orientation. The next thing is we asked the NCCN, so I work at an NCCN hospital, and we asked NCCN uh, providers and the panelists, um, so these are all policymakers in the NCCN who set guidelines, and ask them, well, how important is sexual orientation or gender identity to your specific panel? 84% um, of them said, 84% of the panelists said sexual orientation is irrelevant, including the panelists for colorectal and anal cancer, by the way. 94% um, said that gender identity is irrelevant. And 77% of the panels by the NCCN do not ex specific, specifically address any LGBT cancer issues. So as I mentioned before, the colorectal and anal cancer panel did not discuss, does not discuss LGBT cancer issues, and the panelists uh, nor the panel have any identification or input on sexual orientation or gender identity. Well, obviously for anal cancer, it's immensely important. Obviously, if someone's engaging in anal rectal intercourse and they have a stapled anal rectal, low, low colorectal anastomosis, it is important. Um, so all of these things are important, yet they're not being discussed even by the policymakers who we are. So it's important for all of us to identify that we need to kind of put this a little bit more in the forefront and start talking about this, uh, not only to our patients, but to our colleagues. So I have a scenario, and I'd like to open it up to the rest of the group so we can talk about it in the next, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, this is, these are, I have three scenarios and they're all real world. So these, is, these have all happened to me. So uh, I was ready to go back to the OR, I think it's actually first case, and in the pre-op I have a 30-year-old trans woman. So this is a patient who was born male and identifies as a female and it goes by female pronouns uh, and has changed her gender on the EMR and her license and legally in her name and is by every stretch of the imagination a woman in appearance and in expression. Uh, we're ready to go back and the pre-op nurse is insisting uh, that we can't go back until the patient uh, is able to pee so we can get a beta HCG on the patient to confirm that she is not pregnant. Um, how do you react? This is a patient who in the medical record says she's a trans woman on the first line. Any takers? I'll jump in. You know, I think, um, I think this is just a, a great 
moment to have a discussion with everyone. And I think involving the patient in the um, discussion would also be very important. Um, and just kind of gently state with the nurse, you know, I, I understand that, you know, we do have certain policies in place um, for safety reasons. Um, but, you know, given this current, you know, kind of clinical situation, we have to uh, apply things appropriately to this current clinical situation. And so if it's best, I can uh, actually write a progress note if you need me to, to, you know, place in the computer, you know, why we're not following this policy in this situation. Um, but, you know, uh, it's just, you know, not reasonable or applicable to this situation to ask or request or require um, right. a beta. So. Well, you know, I agree 100%. You handled that much more eloquently than I did at seven o'clock in the morning, for sure. <laughs> 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 so um, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, you know, at the, for this particular encounter, the patient was mortified because here she was outed basically in front of the entire preoperative group. And as you remember, I don't know how your setup is, but ours are separated by like these thin curtains that are supposed to be soundproof and vision proof, which are certainly not. Um, and she was mortified going into surgery. It's the last thing you want to know right before surgery is that you've been outed and now you're super, super uncomfortable in front of everyone that's going to be taking care of you. So yeah, exactly. Dr. Hillman had all the great spots. Um, you know, some of the key takeaways that we had is this, I actually initiated a root cause analysis because of this, because I said this was, you know, a huge patient issue that needed to have more than just a conversation that day with the nurse and the anesthesiologist, which I did. And we ended up doing what you said, Dr. Kimmel, I documented that we were gonna, you know, break away from the policy, but we had to get a lot of people involved in this because obviously our policies were wrong. So we changed a lot of the policies here at the hospital. Um, so the first thing is here in the EMR, what constitutes a documentation of gender? So, you know, oftentimes, I don't know in your specific states, but in Florida, gender is assigned by whatever the insurance company says, because if we're billing for a hysterectomy on a man, the insurance company is not gonna pay for it. So we, what we have to do is have the legal gender as part of our medical record. However, next to that little MF symbol, we have another symbol or a document or a little kind of phrase that describes what the patient's own sexual or gender assignment may be. Um, there's a little hover over on our EMR that then allows you to put into what the, what the patient um, identifies at. So it'll be Julian Sanchez, male, and then it'll say you hover over it and it says patient identifies as male or female. So that was kind of one of our workarounds in the EMR so that everyone is available, everyone's understandable. Not everyone reads that. So then we also have a little kind of alert that pops up only on those patients who are transgender to identify so that everyone understands, hey, this is a transgender patient. So that even as soon as you open up the patient's chart, there's a little highlighted flag that uh, on the top banner that says this is a transgender patient. So everybody understands. We had a hard time with this. We ran through a bunch of different patient committees because we were, are we outing every patient by doing this? But the patients all said, no, we want this. It's more important for us to, for you to get this right um, than it is for us to feel like everyone is being knowledgeable because at the end of the day, we want good care, um, which is understandable, but we had this vetted back and forth a couple of times. Um, so what we ended up doing for our institutional policy is saying, well, it's not that women need a beta HCG, it's anyone who is capable of having children needs a beta HCG. In that case, we were obviously able to say, well, this patient is biologically incapable of having children, even though she is a female by you know, the EMR standard. Um, but since she's biologically incapable of having children, she does not need a beta HCG, no further discussion needed. So we did change the institutional policy to a small word, but it made a big difference in this specific case. Um, the other thing that we had to do is a lot of gossip control. So obviously this was the event of the day in the ER and the OR. Everybody was talking about it. Um, you know, it is something that our role as the surgeon is to kind of put a stop to it pretty quickly. Just say, yeah, no big deal. We're not going to get a HCG. We're going to roll back. We're going to address this separately on a different day. This patient's already uncomfortable. We need to get this case going and we can discuss this at another time away from the patients um, with more institutional leaders on the table. Um, and that's our role, to educate and to lead by example. Um, another thing I just kind of threw in here, too, is oftentimes, uh, you know, in, our, in my OR, at least, um, you know, when I'm bringing a patient back with extensive chondromata and uh, 
precancerous, let's say H cell of the anus, um, there's some degree of um, expectation the patient's very promiscuous. And whether that may or may not be true, that's not our place to decide. Um, I know I'm pre preaching to the choir, choir here, but it's also our place to preach to those who help us in the OR and the preoperative space to be sure that we separate all of these things. We're here to treat the patient, not anything else about them. So in the last little couple of minutes that we have, um, I have a, another scenario um, where you've been asked to help on the design committee of a new clinic. Um, how can we make this space more accepting? And just in the interest of time, I'll let you think about it for a minute. Um, and then I'll give you some of the thoughts that I had. And then I invite you guys to, you know, pitch in if you have any other ideas. Um, so the first thing I said was, well, we need a gender neutral bathrooms, of course. That's uh, kind of uh, common now. So at least one gender neutral bathroom in the space. Uh, one of the fights that we had here was to avoid labeling the women's center. So the women's center in my space encompassed gynecology, oncology, and breast oncology. Um, obviously, men get breast cancer, straight men get breast cancer, cis men get, straight can get breast cancer. So uh, that's really an unacceptable term. Um, also, some trans men still have a uterus and still need to get go see the surgical gynecology oncologist. So, you know, labeling that man who no longer identifies themselves as a man, but forcing them to go to a women's center may be a little discriminating. So we changed it. We, you know, the GI center is called the GI center. So why is the breast center called the women's center? It doesn't really make sense. So we just renamed the women's center to the breast center. And there you go. It's an easy answer. Um, the other thing we did is we started training staff on diversity. Um, and that goes no, far away from this LGBTQI space, also including patients with diverse backgrounds, diverse religions, um, and the importance of that. You know, it's important for us to identify where that patient's coming from, which kind of goes without saying. Um, but oftentimes that front desk staff is our first voice to the patient. So when the patient comes to meet us, they're meeting me last. By the time they've met me, they've met two or three, you know, front desk staff. They've met the valet parker. They've met the resident, the nurse, you know, so I'm the last person they meet. Um, all of those people before me also need to be trained on how to address the patient in terms of pronoun use, terminology, um, and also their cultural background. And, you know, in the non-LGBT space, but let's say in the diversity and inclusion space, um, you want to be sure that we're addressing that patient's social and diverse cultural needs as well at this first face-to-face. Uh, we also change some of our intake forms. Um, we reduce those binary check boxes. Are you a man or a female? Check yes or no. Um, we reduced a lot of that to allow for more open-ended questions and to allow for two-part questions. So um, are you looking over this is almost embarrassed to admit that the sexual orientation and gender questions were all tied together, which goes against that gender bred person, right? So what we did, the first thing we did is we separated them. So we said, uh, kind of who is, you consider yourself sexual orientation, who do you consider yourself gay, straight, whatever you are. Um, and then the second question was, are you the same gender that you were at birth? And what is that gender? So in three questions, which is kind of the more appropriate way of saying this now, we are asking, who do you have sex with? Who were you born as? Who are you now? So we're getting to all the questions that, we that are clinically relevant to us as clinicians. Um, and that's the way we've addressed the issue. I'm sure many hospitals have done the same. The last one, which kind of goes unnoticed, um, is signage. When somebody walks into the office or to the clinic space, they're really aware of their surroundings. It's a nervous environment, obviously. Sometimes they're spending 30 minutes waiting for it to see us before they get called back. And it's really important for that space, A, to be welcoming and B, to be inclusive. So we want the art to be inclusive of everyone. If you go to a space and you consider yourself a cisgender male and you go to a space and everything is pink 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 with flowers everywhere you're going to feel a little out of place um, likewise if you're a trans man and everything is pink 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 you're going to feel a little out of place too um, not for any reason other than we've typically associated by society as pink being a feminine color and since you are not feminine you don't belong um, so you know before we can change the societal color uh, appellation i think it's easier for us to change what kind of colors and signage we use in the space. I had a little sign before about the equality symbol. We have a little equality symbol in my clinic space. We have an equality symbol walking into the hospital. For those that know what it is, it means a lot. For the majority of patients, it doesn't mean anything because they don't know what it is or they're like, hey, cool, they're gay friendly here. 
Um, but I think it really makes a big difference for those that don't. Yeah, sometimes we have patients that have backlash and are not appreciative of our welcoming, but you know, you can't win them all, I guess. Um, so those are kind of issues that I think are really important uh, to discuss with your group and with your staff, um, and even with the institution in general, in order to make the space a little bit more, you know, welcoming for everybody. Does anyone have anything to add on how to make the patient feel more welcome? Or things that you have done that you can share with the group in your space? We had a, a, an episode or an issue a few years back with a patient who was going through the process of transitioning from um, man to woman. And, um, you know, he, he started with us, you know, fully identifying as he, you know, male. Um, and then over the course of time, slowly transitioned and changed his, uh, his name and changed his pronoun and everything. But unfortunately, had not yet fully gone through that process with his insurance provider or her insurance provider. And so uh, at the tail end of things, you know, the insurance and identification and documentation still had uh, listed, you know, male uh, in a male name. And, you know, and at one point she got so irate on that last visit because all of our patient documentation printout things for legal reasons had to be listed as the name that's reflected on the identification and the name that's reflected on the insurance cards. Um, and so we just kind of really had to have a conversation with the staff and with the patient and just say, you know, when you're here in the office, yes, we will address you verbally. Um, by your preferred name and pronoun, but you know, unfortunately, for documentation and paperwork sake, and for your insurance sake, we have to maintain the physical documentation as what you've provided on your, you know, um, on your insurance forms and things like that. So, just yeah. something to kind of be mindful of and and have those conversations. That's a great point, and that's something that the patients may not know. So, I think a lot of the stuff is just like everything in life is just communication. Um, just letting the patient know, hey, listen, it's not that I'm tuning you out or not hearing you. It's the fact that this is what the law requires. Oh, whenever you have stuff, you can just put it right there. Mm -hmm. To pay. Sorry. So yeah, so we have that discussion off, uh, you know, with patients. And I think it's really, really important just to put it out there um, that you know, some of the things we just can't change only because you know, the logistics of uh, payers is kind of at play as well. And then the last one um, is, a patient, Mark, who comes to clinic with his male friend. Mark is registered as a male, but comes in and presenting. So he's expressing very feminine uh, with feminine clothing, feminine gender expression. Um, this particular patient he had a purse, he had his nails done, he was very feminine in demeanor. Um, so how would you respond? I, I think we would all do the same, is address their issue early. I asked Mark, hey Mark, what pronouns do you want me to use? Um, and Mark said he, okay, great. So I, you know, described, I continued to address him and he, I asked him who his male friend is, and that was just his friend. Um, and I said, is it okay for me to talk about your healthcare scenarios or healthcare situation in front of your friend? Um, he said, yes. Um, so then we continued on with the rest of the visit. But this is obviously something that had I not addressed it earlier, I would have been thinking about it the entire time. I know me, and I would not have past step one, because I would have been so worried about offending Mark. So I asked Mark very early. Again, I asked Mark to identify who the friend was so that I didn't feel like I was divulging too much information or not enough information. Mark was HIV. I didn't know if this patient, his friend, knew that he was HIV. I would assume yes, if he brought them, but who knows, you know? So I, you know, that's why I very early in, in the conversation, pretty much as soon as I walked in, I, you know, addressed Mark and asked Mark to set the ground rules on his terms. And that's how we did. And that's how we proceeded with the rest of the, with the rest of the scenario. And actually I had a student with me on this visit. I remember the student was like, oh my God, I would have been so confused walking in because the patient would, he's like, I was just confused the whole time. And then this was kind of a good explanation or good real world um, representation of that gender by person where who you are, who you show the world you are, who you sleep with, and who you were born as are four different axes of who you are. Um, so that's all I had for today. I you know, wanted to be able to just discuss the topic a little bit. Um, with the next conversation, we're going to talk about more clinical issues. Um, we're gonna talk about cancer risks in different populations, especially in the LGBT population. And um, 
be able to, you know, go into a little more clinical detail today was more general. Um, you know, another slide that I'll leave you with as we walk away is um, this is an exercise that sometimes I do with the uh, first year students, medical students, um, where we have privileges for sale. And, you know, pretend that you are, this is, this was done by uh, Safe Space, which is a, a national curriculum. Um, so that I stole this from them. But this is, you know, assume you're in a society where you have no privileges. I give each student 10, you know, fake dollar bills. And there's a list of 30 or 40 of these privileges. And I have them spend their $10 on privileges that in their society they would want. Um, and then they have to you know, describe why they're spending their $10 on these privileges, knowing that if they don't buy it, they're not going to get it. Um, so these are just some really interesting privileges that some people take for granted, some people don't, you know. Um, you know, I'll let you go through them, some of them, but, you know, some of them that were, like, really interesting to me is, um, you know, having multiple positive TV role models that relate to you. Um, you know, if you are a Puerto Rican 12-year-old gay boy and don't have Ricky Martin as your role model, then you may not feel comfortable, comfortable coming out to your grandmother saying, hey, grandmother, I'm gay because you don't have anybody to relate to, but maybe Ricky Martin can relate, you can relate to Ricky Martin and now you feel more comfortable coming out to your grandmother. So you can't underestimate the value of some of these things. For some people they would say, oh, I don't care about a TV role model, I'm my own person, I don't care who I see on TV. Um, it's interesting how everyone's takes on these are very different. Um, you know, it's interesting here in um, where I live in Florida, it was legal, uh, to fire somebody because they were gay, just based on that alone. Um, up until I think two weeks ago, there was a federal DOJ mandate that claimed uh, sexual orientation and gender identity as a group of a protected group, just like age and just like gender. Um, so now because of a federal law superseding state law in Florida now, it is just like in the rest of the country, it's now illegal to fire somebody just because they're gay. But up until a month ago, it was very legal in Florida to get fired just because you were gay. Um, so it, every state obviously is different now with federal laws being a little bit more inclusive. Um, some states are having to by force to, uh, you know, join the group. Um, you know, the other one is uh, obtaining child custody, raising children without fear of state intervention uh, here in Florida as well. This is because I know Florida law well. Um, there are some um, judges in Florida that are not allowing adoption of some states, that, even today, not allowing same-sex couples. There was a judge in South Florida a couple of months ago who uh, up, up two females had a baby by surrogacy and the non-bio mom uh, was denied maternal rights uh, on that baby. And even though they fed, they followed Florida law for surrogacy, um, but the Florida law for surrogacy was built for men and women having a baby through surrogacy. So because this was two women, the judge said that they did not qualify to, to travel under this Florida statute. It's gone to the Supreme Court. And I think the Florida Supreme Court is actually going to rule against it. But either way, it, it, this, these are all real world scenarios. So um, don't discount them. But, you know, some of them are, you know, easy and some of them are a little harder. And, and the whole list I can, I'm happy to share with you, but it's kind of eye opening as to uh, what you take for granted and what you don't. So um, anyways, with that, I'd like to thank you guys all for joining us today in our discussion. If anyone wants to add anything, we have a little bit of time, but I wanted to give everybody some time to either discuss and think about this or get back to your day. I know everyone's busy. Anyone have anything to share? All right, well, again, I thank everybody for joining and for contributing to the conversations. Um, it was great of Dr. Kim Mullins and Stuart to put everything together and to allow us to come to talk about this. Again, we'll talk about it a little bit more with the next session. Um, but thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Sanchez. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you.